everyone. Every one of us knows the three levels of life. They're present in life at given times, we're aware of them. That nitty-gritty level of cause and effect and action and reaction. Even from the very earliest age, little babies learn that, that when they cry in a certain way, that they're going to get a reaction, they're going to have their needs fulfilled. So from the very earliest age, we learn about action and reaction. And then there's that second level, which is the level of our um, intuition, our dreams, the magic, seeing fairies in the garden, or we can even call it, as many people do, their gut knowing. This is nothing more than intuition, as we recognize. But in real terms, it's what's called the occult level, the level of spirit. And then on that third level of life, because we have two sides to our brain, there's the objective side and the subjective side. And that subjective side is where we feel compassion and empathy and pity and oneness for life. But for most people, those three uh, have awareness at, at different times, if at all. Some people never acknowledge their intuition. But when those three levels come together, they're called a state of existence, knowledge, and bliss. Or in Hindu terms, it's called Sat Chit Ananda. They're three, but when they come together, they're one. Sat Chit Ananda. Existence, knowledge, and bliss. And we've been exploring over these last days how can we know when we're living our life with all those three present and therefore abiding in a state of Satchitananda or existence, knowledge and bliss. So to that end we've been telling stories. That's the way we do it, tell stories. So there are several stories. Let's see if when we play with them what it is they evoke in us relative to, to this awareness of what this state of Satchitananda, existence, knowledge and bliss, the coming together seemingly without any separation, the three distinct levels of existence, cause and effect, spirit and oneness. She's all right. She's not a disturbed. <coughs> Molinus Rudin was missing from his office desk for some time. And when he came back to the office, his boss said to him, Where have you been? You just can't go away from the office for a couple of weeks just like that. And Molinus Rudin said, well, I came into your office and you weren't there, but I did exactly what you said. And the boss said, well, what was that? And Mordenas Rudin said, well, I saw this, the label on sign on your desk which said, do it now. So I did. And then there's the story of a certain king. And he had a number of sons because he was a sultan of that ilk. But he only had one daughter, a very beautiful daughter, who he just adored. He loved her with all his heart. But one day he called his daughter to him and he said, Now it's time for you to marry and I'm sending out messages throughout all of the realms to find a suitable prince 
for you to be wed. Well, in that moment, the princess swooned down in a dead faint at his feet. Well, women came from everywhere to fan her and try to revive her, but she wasn't to be revived. She stayed in her swoon. Well, she was taken into the harem and taken care of, and the physicians were called. You know, they burned peacock feathers under her nose and they ground pearls to put under her tongue. But nothing at all seemed to work to revive her. Uh, even her brothers were sent out far and wild to try to find uh, pundits and physicians and uh, others who could perhaps bring her back to a state of being alert and aware again. But nothing seemed to work. Except one day when an old dervish wearing his patched work cloak came to the palace and said to the king, I can cure your daughter. So he was immediately taken into the presence of the princess, lying pallid and very wan and thin on her chaise. Well, the old dervish went over to her and picked up her very delicate hand in his own and put his fingers on her pulse. And then he said to her, Bokhara, Cairo, Istanbul, Samarkand. And all of a sudden her eyes began to flutter. And then the old dervish said to the princess, Diamonds, rubies, gold, silver, pearls. And this time her eyelids fluttered and her hands began to move. And the king who was standing by said, what, 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 What's this all got to do, do, do with curing my daughter? Dervish said, this is the way. Have a scribe write down Samarkand, pearl merchant. And then he bent down and whispered in her ear once again, fat, thin, rich, dark, movement, tall, Handsome. And there was much fluttering. The dervish said, write down as well as Samarkand, pearl merchant, tall, dark and handsome. So the king said, what is all this about? The dervish said, well, ask your daughter yourself, because look, and there she was. She was fully awake, sitting up on her pallet. But she began to cry, and she said, Oh, Father, beloved Father, remember last year when my brother got married and you bought merchants from all over our kingdom to prepare things for the wedding. Uh, well, there was that tall, dark and handsome pearl merchant who came to make pearls, to put on our dresses and all. Well, we fell in love. And I was hoping that I'd be able to convince you to allow me to marry him but of course when you said that you were going to send out messages through all the kingdom that there was to be a prince that I was to wed, my heart was broken and shattered and the king was affronted. I'm not having any daughter of mine marry any merchant. 
She's got to marry a prince who is going to become a king so that you can become a queen. But putting that aside, the king turned round to the dervish and as he had promised and has been, had been said throughout all the kingdom, anyone who cured his daughter was going to have given to him whatever it was that was asked. So the king turned round to the dervish and he said, well, now, please, you brought my daughter back to life again. I'm duty bound to give you whatever it is that you name. Please just tell me what you want. Well, with a little enigmatic smile on his face, the dervish turned to the king and said, I want you to give your daughter her wish. This was, is the only thing that I will accept as a price for bringing her back to life. So what could the king do? He had to fulfill his promise and allow his princess to wed the pearl merchant, tall, dark and handsome from Samarkand. And of course it was a great feast, he did it graciously. And we know the end of all of these stories, they got married and had many children. <laughs> so these simple stories, because they have a way in us, because fundamentally existence, that level of cause and effect, our in intuition, our gut knowing, our heart's awareness, as we might call it, and that interrelatedness that is with everyone, go together in life. They belong together, don't they? But for most people, they're sporadic or even apparently absent. People don't acknowledge their gut feelings or their intuitions or take notice of their dreams or believe that they really saw the fairy in the garden. And they can even negate their feelings of pity and compassion with conditioned mind. We know how all of that works. So how do we know when those three things are simultaneously present in our life. What is it about this story that indicates that the dervish was operating in all of these three levels at once? We know, because we have it ourselves. But how would you translate it? How would you express that which is there in our life when those three are together, functioning seamlessly? To bring about a state which in some persuasions is called the ocean of oneness, or such it and under. How do we know? What is it? We know when it's not there, when we're not present, or when we've got a dialogue going on in our head. Should I, I shouldn't I, what if? Um, when there's dialogue, it's not present not there. And we know it's only there when we're present. Here, right here, now, always. So these two things are clues for us. But there's something else that allows us to know when we are living in a state of existence, knowledge and bliss. And that's the question that's asked. What is it? What is it that we can know that goes with presence, goes with an absence of 
internal dialogue. Surrendering has to come, hasn't it? That's a prerequisite of this. Surrendering. There's no need for movement or anywhere to go. You're just there. You're just there. All right. There's a clue. We're just there, or here, whatever you like to call it. But what is it? Peace is there as an adjunct of it, of course. And harmony, they go together in the state of Satchitana. Emptiness? Emptiness is what it, ab- it abides in, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Or we could even call it a state of voidness. But we know in life there's no such thing as emptiness. Mm-hmm. We can have a feeling of emptiness, but it's not really empty. It's just a feeling of hollowness, as we can say a feeling of sadness, and to giving it a description. So that's what we've been exploring with these stories and continue to do. Because we do need to know that we are in this state. We know when we're not in it, when we've arrived at it. So therefore it's explicable, it's expressible. And that's what our challenge is. Because in so doing, we know who we are, and as an adjunct of that, we know what is happening in our relationship with life. Isn't it so? It has to come with that. It has to follow that when we know who we are in this present moment, knowing that we're in this state of Satchitananda, that we can also know what our relationship with existence is. So to be able to grasp this is an important stage for us to arrive at, knowing who we are and what we do. Because then we answer all the questions. What is the purpose of life? What am I here for? What's it all about? They're answered in any given moment of our life when we're in a state of such a Thank you.